Okay, uh, hello again uh, to all of you who were here just a couple of minutes ago when I said hello and checked the sound. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for the August edition of Dragon Trails monthly webinar series. Today we'll be going back to basics a little bit and answering some of the most frequently asked questions uh, that we get from travel brands that are just getting started in their marketing to China. And we'll also be answering some of the questions that you emailed in over the past couple of weeks for us. Um, so just to introduce uh, the structure of how things will run today, uh, we'll start by talking about kind of the things you need to know when you're just getting started with marketing to Chinese outbound tourism. Then we'll look at some of the major travel trends in the market, uh, move on to uh, some of the digital platforms that are most important to understand and be able to use. Uh, we'll talk a bit about promotional partners uh, such as KOLs and um, online travel agencies. Um, and then we'll finish up by pointing you in the direction of some additional resources where you can look into uh, more of the topics that we've introduced today. And then at the very end of the presentation, we will have some time for Q&A. Um, I think that a lot of your questions will hopefully be answered by the webinar um, or you will have sent in questions uh, beforehand so that we have time to prepare those. Um, but if you think of anything while we're delivering the webinar, you can ask those at any time by using the Q&A button, which you should see um, on your screen. That is an easier way of getting the questions to us than using the chat function, uh, because with the chat function, sometimes we don't see the questions or it's hard to keep track of. So uh, the Q&A button is the best way to make sure we see and can answer the questions at the end of the webinar. Um, so I'll just start by introducing myself. Um, for those of you who have attended our webinars before, you've probably already heard me. Uh, my name's Sienna Perulis Cook. I'm the communications manager for Dragon Trail. So I write most of the content that you'll find on the Dragon Trail website, uh, including reports and articles on trends in Chinese outbound tourism and digital marketing. Um, I am currently based in the UK, but I previously lived, studied, and worked in China for seven years. Um, and today I'm joined by Matt Grayson, our President Americas. Uh, hi, Matt. Hi, everybody. Uh, glad you can make it to our webinar today. It's uh, good to see such a great turnout, and we'll get started here shortly. Um, so for those of you who might be joining us for the first time, uh, I'll just briefly introduce Dragon Trail Interactive. We are a digital marketing and solutions agency which helps travel brands around the world to connect with Chinese consumers and the Chinese travel trade. Um, we're based in Beijing, uh, but we have offices in Shanghai, Xi'an, as well as international offices in London and Lexington. Um, and today I'm speaking from uh, the UK and Matt is based in the US. Um, so we are very focused uh, completely on China, completely on travel, and completely on digital. And so this makes us um, extremely focused, and it means that we have a lot of expertise uh, in these very specific areas that uh, we can share with you. We have over 60 clients on six continents. Um, here is a sampling of our clients kind of focusing on the Americas, uh, since that will loosely be uh, the theme that we're talking about today in our webinar. And uh, before we get started with today's webinar, um, I'd just like to let you know that all of our... Um, hi, Roy. Um, uh, just a minute, sorry. Um, oh, okay, go back. Um, all of our past webinars for the year, since we do them every month, are available to review online. Um, there are links here. We will be sending out a PDF of the presentation that will have links in it uh, with everybody who attends today. And so if you would like to go back to review any of our past webinars, or if there's a topic that we start talking about today that you're particularly interested in learning more about that might be mentioned in one of these webinars, you can review that. Um, and you can also always find them on our website uh, under the videos and presentation section. And this webinar will also be available to review um, probably by the end of this week on our website. And we'll send everyone uh, the direct link for that as well. Um, so now uh, we will get started. And uh, first up is Matt. Hi, everybody. And I've got the first question today. And before I get into that, I just want to remind you that we're going to be going through a lot of questions today. 
And uh, if we went through them all and gave them the treatment that they deserve, this would be a webinar that would continue into next week. So uh, we're gonna give uh, necessarily brief answers, but uh, you know how to reach us, uh, either Sienna or myself, if you uh, require additional information or have any further questions that you, that you wanna ask. So first off, uh, the first question of the day is, I have not marketed to Chinese consumers at all. What's the first thing I need to do to be successful? And the short answer there is find out what Chinese consumers think about you, understand your target market, and get a Chinese name. First of all, you really need to do a little bit of homework. It's good to do some intelligence gathering by looking on Chinese travel websites. It's good to know what Chinese know or think they know about your product. Find out the reputation and popularity of your destination or popularity of the kind of activity that you are promoting among Chinese travelers. If you are a destination known for nature or culture or shopping, a little legwork online can give you ideas on how you can be successful. Check Chinese travel websites and social media to get an understanding of your reputation and what things are popular and should be promoted and or what things are problematic and need to be fixed. For example, have past travelers noted a lack of Chinese signage or language acumen? If so, correcting that could give you a great marketing tool and demonstrate your commitment to the market. Your research can also provide you with an understanding of what kind of Chinese traveler your destination appeals to. The market is huge and extremely segmented. So it's important to understand who you want to target. Families, solo travelers, luxury travelers, women travelers, etc. Also, get a Chinese name if you don't have one. And hotels and attractions should check with local tourism promotion boards to ensure they are using the correct destination name. Armed with your research and knowledge, then you can start to formulate your strategy to reach Chinese consumers. Social media must be a major component of any outreach to consumers. And as we go through the questions today, you'll see the major role that WeChat and other platforms play in daily life. And really, if you aren't on social media, you most likely won't be heard. Thanks, Matt. Um, our next question is about language. So the question is, I don't have any staff that speaks Chinese. Will social media and marketing materials in English be effective? The short answer to that is no. Um, now that we're seeing more and more younger travelers coming out of China, there are a number of travelers and also a shift to independent travel. A lot of travelers do have very high proficiency in English and they will be able to function absolutely in the destination in English. But that doesn't mean that they want to do their research in English. Um, just as if you speak a foreign language, if you're researching a destination, you might feel more comfortable doing it in English or your native language. Um, also, there's so much information in Chinese on the internet that if you are in English, then they'll probably be reading the information that's in Chinese instead. Thirdly, having information in Chinese really signifies um, a welcoming attitude towards Chinese tourists as well, and this can be very important. So if you don't have anyone on your staff that speaks Chinese, um, there are some kind of temporary cost-effective solutions that um, might help you to get around this, especially if you're just getting started. Um, a lot of places in the world have a very high population of um, Chinese university students, and you might be able to recruit an intern who would be um, happy to be involved and uh, get involved with the experience, maybe help you do that initial research that Matt mentioned, looking at your reputation on Chinese social media and travel websites or even help you to start putting out some social media content. Um, in terms of working with B2B, um, in some Chinese travel agents also do speak English and they're happy to use materials that are in English. Um, we've heard this from travel agents that work, for instance, with Peru, that they can't read Spanish, but if the materials are in English, that's absolutely fine with them. Um, so it's good to check with the agent that you're working with directly. Um, however, if you're attending things like exhibitions and trade shows in China, you really do need to bring an interpreter or somebody on your team who speaks Chinese to get the most out of that kind of show, as there are so many people in the industry who won't be able to speak English or won't feel so comfortable speaking English. Okay, move on to the next question, Matt. All right, I've got the next one. 
question is, I have a rep firm in China for my destination. Do I also have to engage in social media or other digital marketing? And the short answer to that is be clear on what services your rep firm provides. It, when it comes down to it's about your strategy and your market. Um, if you focus primarily on groups, uh, then a physical B2B presence may, may be more of an emphasis than if you were niche product or destination. Uh, physical presence at in industry events is still very important for B2B, but digital and social media cannot be neglected. Uh, you need to understand if digital is part of the rep firm's work and it's not just an afterthought. You can reach many more travel agents through WeChat than by attending one event in one city. Uh, having a digital marketing strategy is also crucial. It's not enough that a rep firm has the capability of conducting social and digital marketing. They really must have the means to execute your strategy in, a, uh, in an efficient and effective way. Also, when you're looking for rep firms, don't neglect to ask about their social media marketing capabilities. Ask for examples of social media work as you would for other representational work. Uh, the changing demographics of Chinese travelers mean that services your rep firm may have provided for you over the past three to five years and provided rather well during that time frame may not be optimized for the current outbound market. Uh, talk to your peers about their spending mix and take that into account when planning for the future. I know I speak with potential clients all the time that tell me we have a contract with a firm in China already. When I ask them if that firm does digital or social media marketing on their behalf, many times I get, I don't know, as the answer. Uh, make sure your rep firm has the capabilities of serving you in a constantly changing landscape, either by themselves or forming relationships with other agencies. Uh, don't let there be any gaps in your marketing outreach. And with that, I think uh, we'll move to the next question. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, now we'll move on to the travel trends section. Um, so we'll start with a very basic question of who is the typical Chinese tourist? Um, this is pretty much an impossible question to answer. We will move forward in a few slides to talk about some general demographic data, looking at kind of the biggest markets in terms of spending, in terms of age and gender ratio. Um, however, as the Chinese travel, outbound travel market has grown so tremendously over the past years, um, and is looking like it might be up to 160 billion, um, no, sorry, 160 million outbound trips, uh, but still a lot, um, at the end of 2018, um, it means that the market is also becoming increasingly segmented. And so you have everything from um, young millennial uh, luxury travelers to silver travelers to group travelers um, to very experienced um, independent travelers. And so uh, it's a question of understanding your market and what kinds of travelers your destination or business is attracting. So for instance, um, travelers who go to Peru are likely to be older, they're likely to be more experienced, and they're likely to have more money because they need the time, money, and experience to go to a destination that is very far away and fairly niche. Um, in Los Angeles, you might get more uh, Chinese visitors who are visiting friends and relatives since there is such a large Chinese population in Los Angeles. In Thailand, you might get more group travel or less experienced tourists who are staying closer to China. Um, and so what segment your destination is attracting um, will also affect uh, what those travelers want to do once they reach the destination and also how they research and book their travel. Um, but more than just understanding what kinds of travelers are already coming to your destination, it's also important to think about what kinds of travelers you want to come to your destination. Um, Thailand is its not in the Americas, but it's a good example here of a country that gets a lot of very big group tours, um, but now they're starting to want to focus more on luxury travelers and people who will stay longer, um, have kind of a deeper uh, tourism experience, and um, importantly, spend and more money in the country. Um, and so all of this uh, will help to shape uh, what kinds of marketing you do and the kind of tone you take in your marketing towards Chinese outbound tourists. 
Um, so as I said, we'll look at some of the basic demographic data in a few slides. Um, but one notable trend also to point out is that Chinese really aren't as shopping centric as they were several years ago. Um, and this might not be the case for some destinations that are especially well known for outlets or something. Um, however, we are seeing that there is a shift from going abroad to shop to wanting to have more experiences. And because of this, it means when you're thinking about your marketing, being able to tell the story of your destination or business or brand is increasingly important. Um, and now we'll move on to talk about uh, group tours versus FIT. Yeah, and that question is, don't most Chinese travel in tour groups? And the short answer is not anymore, but this depends on the destination. Right now, between 20 and 40% of all Chinese outbound travelers are FITs, with another 40% or so opting for semi-independent travel. So tourism isn't just about the, the motor coach tours anymore. However, many Chinese will still prefer to travel together with a small group of family members or friends, and SIT and customized tours are growing in popularity. Uh, traditional group tours still appeal to less experienced travelers, including older people, those who don't speak English, and travelers from lower tier Chinese cities. But at the same time, travelers to niche destinations like Latin America may still prefer to travel as part of a package tour, as these destinations are less well known or established for Chinese tourists. Many destinations and attractions are seeing a decline in Chinese tourists because they early on formed relationships with receptive tour operators and that were group focused. I know I'm hearing that they're struggling now with the rise of FIT travel. They don't have the tools at their disposal to reach independent travelers. In the US especially, group prices uh, have risen because of new Department of Transportation regulations regarding drivers' hours of service. These changes have disrupted the West Coast group market in particular, and are causing more emphasis on FIT marketing and market development. And Let's see, I think Sienna now is going to talk to us. Yeah, I might topic. also add, uh, just in terms of the group tours, um, when we're talking about the semi-independent travel market, which is also sometimes referred to as modular travel. So these are people who, they won't go on a completely packaged tour, but they will use um, kind of a group tour or a travel agent to book some or part of their trip. Um, and I think that this is a growing area, maybe especially in terms of luxury travelers, uh, where people are really optimizing for small groups uh, where they'll travel together with maybe friends or multiple generations of the same family, um, but and they'll have everything booked, but it won't be a big package that they've signed up for. It'll be more a group of, um, let's say, four to ten people, and this would be hyper-customized where they um, really have their own ideas about the kinds of things that they want to see, and they need um, a tour provider or a travel agent to be able to put that all together for a very personal personalized package for them. Um, and so this is an area that's probably growing quite a lot um, alongside independent travel. Um, for the next question, um, since we've given you a lot of vague answers on not being able to describe um, the typical Chinese stories is, well, what can you tell us about demographics? And there are some things that we can say. Um, although the market is so large that even um, a very niche part of the Chinese outbound travel market is liable to be very big um, and to have the potential um, to bring in a lot of tourists and a lot of money. Um, but there are some overall trends as well. Um, right now, the generation that's born in the 1980s is really driving travel spending and is the biggest um, demographic when it comes to uh, the age group for outbound tourism. However, the a uh, generation born in the 1990s is coming up very quickly. Uh, they've really just started to enter the job market and start earning in China, which gives them a lot more disposable income and ability to travel. So according to the Chinese International Travel Monitor that was released by Hotels.com uh, last month, they actually found an 80% year-on-year rise for um, travel spending from Chinese born in the 1990s. And then another report from Tencent uh, on the post-2000s generation. So these are people 
uh, born after the year 2000. So the oldest ones are 18. They're definitely not in the job market yet. Um, but we can already see that this generation is better traveled than the decade before, especially when it comes to long haul destinations such as the US. Um, so these are all kind of generations to keep an eye on um, because they're definitely coming. Um, and we've got the uh, some information on the Chinese International Travel Monitor that I mentioned, as well as a uh, translation of the Tencent report on post 2000s, uh, both available on our website. Um, another main thing to say about the Chinese outbound travel market is that in terms of leisure travel, it is dominated by women um, with 56% in some places, 60% uh, or even more of travelers are women. Um, in terms of business travel, that is more skewed towards men, um, but leisure, it's more women. So that's something to think about in the kind of imagery that you use in marketing um, and just the, when you're envisioning the traveler that you're going to welcome. Um, and not only are women making up about 56% of the numbers, but they're also making up um, a vast majority of the spending. So that is quite important as well. Um, but as I said, uh, even niche markets, thinking about things like silver travelers, um, the over 60s, I mean, they're really, they're getting on to WeChat as well. And um, it's either older travelers that they're now venturing out on their own, or there's especially a trend of maybe those born in the 1980s or the 1970s paying for their elderly parents to um, have a trip abroad. Um, so this is an important market to think about as well, especially if you have the kind of product uh, that might appeal to an older generation, uh, for instance, such as cruises. Um, another thing to point out is that we are starting to see the rise of second and third tier cities. So far, Chinese outbound travel has really been dominated by first tier cities uh, like Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. Um, but now we're seeing people from smaller cities in China starting to travel abroad. And we think that this might create a small bump in group tourism um, because these travelers are less likely to be um, as experienced as those in first tier cities. But we also think that they're going to catch up faster. It won't be um, seeing the exact same kind of transition that we saw with travelers from first tier cities. They're likely to become more experienced and start using digital tools um, a lot more quickly than uh, their earlier counterparts did. Um, our next question uh, was sent in um, by uh, an attendee who's in South Africa. So although this webinar is, it's basically focused on the Americas, um, we got these questions that are quite interesting and I also think they're very applicable to the South American market um, in many ways. So uh, it's a group of questions, which is uh, which African countries and regions are preferred by Chinese tourists? Is South Africa on their wish list? Is FIT a preferred mode of travel to Africa rather than group travel? What age groups most commonly visit Africa? And is luxury travel popular with Africa in Africa with Chinese visitors? Um, so in terms of the market, um, I would say that like South America, Africa would be a destination that would be more desirable for travelers that might be a little bit older um, because they have more experience, they have more time, and they have more money. Um, you wouldn't go to Africa or South America as the first time you ever travel abroad. Um, and you also need the, the time and money to get to a destination like this. Um, actually, there was recently um, a survey by uh, the um, online um, travel agency called Travel Zoo, and they found that among Chinese tourists um, who were planning quote unquote in depth travels, Africa was actually the leading destination, um, with 60% choosing Africa, placing it above. Japan and Australia for in-depth travel. So there is interest here, but it's more with experienced travelers. Um, as Matt mentioned too about group tourism, um, while these kinds of very experienced travelers with money and everything, they might choose to be more independent if they're going to somewhere like the US or to Europe where they feel very comfortable. If they're going to a destination that is more niche or um, where they are not so sure about making arrangements or speaking the local language, um, like uh, somewhere in South America or Africa, they're more likely actually to travel as part of a group um, or to want kind of a customized tour where they're a little bit more taken care of on a package. In terms of popular countries in Africa, um, the 
Um, the most um, popular destinations are Morocco, Tunisia, South Africa, Namibia, Kenya, Madagascar, and Tanzania. So we see some in the north of the country and then some in the south where you get things like safaris. Um, something important to say about Morocco and Tunisia is that um, these countries have experienced phenomenal growth in Chinese tourism over the last year. With Morocco, the numbers are up 378% year on year, and Tunisia is up 240% year on year. And this is because both of those countries um, abolished visas for Chinese tourists uh, last year. Um, and so you see this major jump in tourism. However, you have to understand that those numbers were probably quite small to begin with. So a huge jump like that is not the same thing as, for instance, if um, Chinese tourism to America was up 300% year on year. Um, and it's unclear if that kind of growth rate will be sustainable, but it's um, a good way of seeing how uh, visa policy can really affect uh, Chinese tourism numbers. But at the same time, uh, since these questions were from somebody in South Africa and are specific to South Africa, during the same year, tourism to South Africa was actually down 17% when we look at the Chinese outbound tourism market. Um, and we would say that this is um, possibly because they've been doing less marketing. A few years ago, South Africa was doing really a lot of marketing in China, and um, they've been a little bit less proactive in the last couple of years. Um, there also has been some negative media coverage, especially in terms of safety issues in South Africa, which hasn't helped. Um, and furthermore, uh, until very recently, I think last week, uh, they signed a new visa agreement. Um, it was still quite complicated for Chinese travelers to get visas to South Africa. And so if you have other places in Africa, of course, Morocco is very far away from South Africa, but if you don't need a visa to Morocco and it's complicated to get one to South Africa and you're deciding between the destinations, uh, the one that doesn't need the visa, um, is uh, maybe an easy choice. However, uh, South Africa recently um, agreed on a visa waiver scheme that is similar to the one uh, that we can find in Peru and other countries where uh, travelers who have a valid visa to um, the US or the Schengen area or Australia um, don't need to apply for a separate visa to South Africa. Um, so I think that that answers um, all of the kind of Africa questions and um, anything more specific, you can just email us uh, and we'll answer more. Um, so now we'll move on from travel trends to talk about digital platforms. Um, and we'll start with the really big one, which is WeChat. Right, and uh, the question that is asked simply is what is WeChat? And so uh, in the, uh, with deference to time pressures here, I will not go into extreme depth on what WeChat is. Uh, you can see from the, uh, the graphic there a lot of uh, functionality that WeChat provides. Um, WeChat is China's number one mobile app and social media platform with one billion monthly active users, actually slightly more than that. And I would imagine that a lot of people that are uh, in the audience uh, uh, for the webinar actually have a, a WeChat account already. 50% uh, of WeChat users spend 90 minutes or more every day on the platform. And it started as a simple chat platform like WhatsApp, but it now combines social sharing, marketing services, including travel services, and mobile payments. It's used as a work tool as well as a social one. So it's important for both B2B and B2C marketing. Since 2017, WeChat mini programs also offer location-based service functionality as well as more marketing and sales tools. Well, WeChat was first released in 2011 and in seven years has become one of the world's largest standalone apps. Forbes magazine dubbed it one of the world's most powerful apps. In addition, some experts have identified WeChat as a serious competitor to Visa, MasterCard, and American Express. From a travel standpoint, it would be foolish not to accept either or all of those credit cards that were listed and similarly, not having a presence on this platform could be uh, detrimental to you as well in the long run. I call WeChat a life platform since you can do nearly everything through it. And the statistics are truly mind boggling. And you know, as I mentioned earlier, there are more than a billion monthly users, uh, 902 million daily active users, 38 billion messages sent each day, 6.1 billion voice messages, and there are more than 14 million corporate accounts. 
Also, there are 639 million people accessing WeChat from a smartphone, and there are uh, slightly more than 800 million users for WeChat Pay. The bottom line with WeChat is with all the functionality and its ubiquitous nature in China and among the Chinese speaking population, if you don't have some presence on WeChat, you're invisible to a vast segment of potential Chinese visitors. And I think next, Sienna will look at the difference between WeChat and Weibo. Thanks, Matt. <clears throat> So uh, the other Chinese social media platform is Weibo. And actually what's quite interesting, I was just reviewing um, an article today that was written back in 2014. And at that time it was saying Weibo is the dominant Chinese social media platform, but it looks like WeChat is catching up. And <laughs> WeChat has absolutely caught up and really surpassed Weibo. Um, Weibo is, um, well, WeChat, it's hard to say exactly what its equivalent is because it comprises things like WhatsApp and Facebook and Apple Pay. Um, Weibo is, is basically Twitter. Um, it's a microblogging platform um, that is, it's very open and easy to share uh, things on it. And when WeChat started to take off, um, Weibo had a hard time and actually went into decline for a few years. Um, but starting last year, I think Weibo has had a comeback. And um, right now it's posted some very good numbers for Q2 2018 with uh, 431 million monthly active users, which is uh, very far up from how it was a year ago or two years ago. Um, and part of the reason behind its comeback is uh, short video and live streaming. Um, uh, I think it is Ichii and Meow Pie, uh, that's a live streaming and a short video platform in China are actually built into Weibo and part of Weibo. And as video marketing and short video and live streaming in China has risen in popularity, uh, Weibo was really able to leverage this um, to make their own comeback. Um, another thing, another reason that Weibo has come back is that it's really been embraced by the younger generation as well. Um, just as how Facebook has um, become seen as it used to be a very young platform, but now it's um, it's a little bit older as the original users have got older and older people have joined it. Similar uh, things have happened with WeChat where now it's like your parents and your grandparents are on it. So um, younger generations like in the 19, born in the 1990s or earlier than that, they've moved back to Weibo as kind of the, the younger, cooler platform. Um, and Weibo is also used uh, quite a lot for luxury brands. Um, I think for travel marketing, it's a good idea to have both platforms. Um, they're complementary, uh, they're both very popular, and they can be used in different ways as well. So for WeChat, for instance, if you're an official account and you're publishing an article, you can publish something that is much longer, it's more in-depth into a certain topic, it has lots of pictures, and it's something that you work on for a few weeks before you publish. Whereas Weibo is more responsive to kind of current events Events, for instance, uh, somebody, your country wins a game at the World Cup, and so you can immediately create a post about it um, with just um, a few characters and a hashtag or something. Um, and so in that way, it's, um, it's a good complement in a platform that's a little bit different than WeChat. Um, so next up is uh, differences between social media in China and in the West. Right, and, and that is the question. What are the main differences between social media in China and the West? And the short answer is, apart from there being entirely different platforms, WeChat is a closed system, unlike Facebook, that offers many more services than any Western social media. Chinese social media users are more comfortable with promotions and sales, as well as influencer marketing. And of course, Chinese social media platforms are subject to censorship, and this affects content. In China, you need a VPN just to use Western social media platforms, and phones purchased in China can't access these apps to download. So you must use Chinese social media platforms to reach a, uh, a Chinese audience. WeChat is far more advanced than any Western social media platform. For example, uh, can you imagine paying your electricity bill via Facebook, for example? but its closed circuits make it more difficult for content to go viral. Censorship, censorship is a reality, but not one that should uh, affect tourism marketing. 
a few chief differences uh, beyond this, of course, China has a larger, more active user base. Uh, social media usage is more mobile focused. Uh, KOLs, key opinion leaders, are more prominent. We'll be talking about that a little bit later. And opinions matter and so do ratings. And reputation management has a bigger role uh, in Chinese social media than it does uh, in the West at this point. And I think uh, the next question that Sienna will address is what restrictions there are on social media advertising. Hello, are you there, Sienna? Oh, so sorry, I was on mute. Um, <laughs> I was answering the question, uh, but nobody could hear me. Um, so for foreign uh, overseas accounts and for all WeChat accounts, actually, if you want to do advertising on WeChat, your account has to be verified. And we'll cover how to get verification um, in the next couple of questions. Um, so first, you need to get your account verified, uh, which is a process that takes a little bit of time and uh, $99. And then you also have to get this WeChat advertising function enabled um, on the back end of WeChat. For accounts that are based in China, you can just go into the back end and turn it on. Um, but for overseas accounts, you also you have to apply for this and you have to get a uh, an advertising contract with Tencent um, to be able to set that up. However, there's no there's no fee to turn on that advertising function, um, but you have to do it through them and you can wait around two weeks um, to be able to before you can actually do any advertising. Um, and then there are certain industries that are not allowed to advertise on social media in China at all. So this includes medical services, charities, overseas car rental, and then any industries that are illegal in China, and that includes gambling. Uh, so casinos uh, cannot advertise online. And, and oh. yeah. Over to you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> and the next question is, I have a Chinese language website in the US. Do I need one in China too? Answer, ideally, yes. I think actually definitely yes. Uh, loading speed and the possibility of getting shut down are just two main reasons to have a Chinese-based website. Uh, foreign hosted websites can be very slow to load in China, and they can even be blocked altogether regardless of the content. Uh, China's Great Firewall filters all information from foreign websites to make sure it's safe for China, which results in very slow load times. Additionally, as many websites are hosted on a shared server, if even one of these sites has content that the Chinese authorities choose to block, it means that every other website hosted by that server gets blocked too. Uh, censorship aside, there are also issues of capacity. Uh, internet usage outpaces outpaces investment in underwater cables and routing systems. And this results in frequent bottlenecks and extremely slow uploads of external sites. Companies and organizations that want Chinese viewers to access their site need to consider that it will be frequently unavailable or load at such slow speeds that people may become frustrated and go elsewhere. Uh, this is particularly critical for complex websites where a lot of information has to load or those featuring payments. Uh, to avoid this happening, you, your Chinese website should be hosted in China with a .cn address. You'll need to get a Chinese ICP license to register a website, which is a complicated process and requires that your company is legally registered in China, but an agency like ours can uh, obtain the ICP license and register the .cn domain on your behalf. Um, I might also uh, add to that, I just got a, a good example of a travel website that it's uh, not for a destination, but it's for a company called National Express in the UK, um, which is a bus service similar to Greyhound in the US. And 
Uh, there's absolutely nothing offensive or political on their website, but for some reason it's blocked in China. So um, I've had the experience that uh, when Chinese friends are coming to England and they need to book a bus uh, from the airport to the city they're going to, then they need me to go check the times for them and uh, book the bus for them. And they wouldn't have even found that website at all if I hadn't told them about it. So um, it's a good example of how a travel website that you might not expect to be blocked uh, is is blocked in China and so unavailable uh, for people in China to be able to use, uh, which is very inconvenient. Um, and if they had a, a .cn website, <laughs> that would not happen. Um, so moving on, I uh, mentioned before that I talk about getting verification for um, a WeChat account. And so this is a question that was sent in by a attendee in Canada who says that he wants a public WeChat account for his Canadian tourism business um, to use for content marketing in China. And he wants it to be something that people in China can see and how to get that set up. Um, and so this is a very good question, actually, because Tencent really keeps changing the rules. Uh, even this year alone, there have been a couple of major changes to how overseas um, people overseas are able to register WeChat accounts. Um, and the latest one was at the end of June. Um, and then the first one was in January. And so it's really changing all the time. And it's a little bit hard to keep track of. Um, and so there was a time when it was very easy to set up an official account if you were overseas, except that nobody in China would be able to see the content on it. So uh, it's really not worth doing unless you're only talking to uh, people in the Chinese diaspora that might already be in your country. Um, they have changed that. They first changed it in January, but said that you had to spend like a huge amount of money on advertising. And then they've changed this again now in June. So. Um, you can now set up an official account on WeChat from overseas and Chinese people in China will be able to see it. You can do it uh, through the WeChat website, which is there. And uh, most of the instructions on that is in English. And I think they are able to provide English language service. Um, there are still some catches, though. Um, one of the things is um, you can only get a service account, not a subscription account. Um, in some ways, that might even be better. Uh, there isn't a huge amount of difference between the two, except that a subscription account can post an article every single day and a service account can only post once a week. Um, but then you can use that once a week post. You can have many articles inside of it. So it's like a weekly newsletter. So that works quite well for content marketing and can be complemented, for instance, um, by a Weibo account where you push out a lot more content. Um, a service account will also allow you um, to do do more in terms of servicing clients um, and there might be more of a move towards service accounts um, anyway. So um, it's not a huge problem. Um, then you also must get the account verified. So there's a long list of kind of business documents that you need to provide to Tencent, including your business license and a bank account that is um, has the business name and all of that is listed on the WeChat website. Um, you also will have to pay um, a one-time fee of uh, 99 US dollars uh, to get the account verified. Um, and I think that is about it. Um, but <laughs> these things, again, it, it might change in the future. Um, but so far, uh, the solution is, is better than what was available before too, and is something that uh, you should hypothetically be able to do on your own um, if you can get all of the kind of official documentation that they need. Um, moving on, we have had a, a question about this already, uh, so no, I'll answer it. It's uh, how do I build an audience on social media in China? Um, a lot of the advice that we would give for this is very similar to the advice uh, really for any kind of social media in the world, um, although some of it is more specific to the Chinese market. Um, so I would start by having good content. Um, I mean, that is really just universal in terms of social media. Uh, we've got some examples here. Um, on the left is a post by um, Los Angeles about the best sunsets in Los Angeles. And we found that content on Facebook that, I mean, not on Facebook, sorry, on WeChat, that has lots of pictures and beautiful imagery, especially of nature um, with very colorful images. It does really well. Um, I think it's because a lot of people using uh, WeChat are in big Chinese cities and there's a lot of traffic and maybe pollution and um, gray buildings around them. So they want to see pictures of beautiful nature and imagining, uh, imagine escaping on their holidays. 
apart from content, um, I think it's important to um, promote user generated content and interaction with users as well as competitions. Those things would really go hand in hand. Uh, and in the middle picture here is an example of that from Destination Canada, where um, a year or two ago, they ran a contest um, through the Chinese short video app, uh, Maypai, which is uh, one of the top short video apps that asked users to make a video about their impressions of Canada. And then the user, um, those that had the most likes or those that won the competition got a free trip to Canada. And so this meant that a lot of people were making videos and uploading them online all about Canada. And a lot of people started to follow the account and become engaged with it because everybody wants a free trip to Canada. Um, we've seen a few other kinds of competitions like that in the last year that have done really well. Um, last Australia, I mean, last uh, summer, Australia did a campaign on WeChat uh, with a hashtag called me in Australia and um, every week you could upload content about your own travel experience in Australia and they would give out some small prizes randomly uh, to some people and it meant that Australia did really well um, over the summer on WeChat last year. Uh, this year Viking Cruises has really done very well with the competition where they had a competition running for um, for many weeks where you could win a trip together with your parents to go on a Rhine River cruise. And this not only got a lot of interaction and a lot of new followers for the account, but they've really been able to sustain it. Whereas before that account was maybe ranked about between seventh and ninth place on the, um, the cruise ship rankings uh, on the WeChat rankings that Dragon Trail releases every week. Um, even once the competition has closed, now they're often in the top three. Um, and so we can see that that competition was um, a great driving factor for them for uh, their audience on WeChat. Um, also B2B, um, I think that working with Chinese travel agents and uh, adding them on WeChat and letting them know about your content on WeChat or other social media, uh, they might be liable to share that and then either their clients might see that or other colleagues might see that too. So that's a good way of expanding reach. And then finally, QR codes. Um, QR codes are really used very uh, often in China, mostly for payment, but also for scanning to get information or to follow an account. Um, there's some really beautiful creative work going on with QR codes um, in China where they're, um, like you can see in this ad for American Express, where they're quite beautiful and creative and not just uh, ugly black and white squares. Um, and so, this could be used in, in advertising uh, like this to catch people's attention, but even just uh, from offline to online um, in your, let's say that you're running a, a hotel or you have an attraction to be able to display a QR code around that users can scan and then follow you uh, on Chinese social media uh, is a great way of picking up more followers too. Um, and now we'll move on to the promotional partner section. Um, and first talk about uh, B2B. Right, and the question is, is social media marketing effective for reaching Chinese travel agents? And the short answer, yes, many travel brands run B2B WeChat accounts or mix B2B and B2C content. WeChat is also an effective platform for communicating with and training, tra and training Chinese travel agents. Um, as we noted in the, the statistics about WeChat, uh, it's ubiquitous and nearly everybody does everything on WeChat already. So 90% um, of all WeChat users use the platform for work. And so uh, agents can share articles with clients and on their moments as well as with their colleagues and it makes their work easier to have everything that they're doing on WeChat. Uh, Dragon Trail has a few solutions for reaching travel agents via WeChat. Um, and a Travel Academy and CTA Live. Uh, CTA is Dragon Trail's WeChat based training and certification program uh, that's used by more than 20 global travel brands and more than 27,000 Chinese travel agents. Agents can study anytime, anywhere, and engage with video and audio. Uh, CTA Live is a platform for conducting webinars by WeChat with live webinars or recordings. 45 minutes of webinar, 15 minutes of Q&A, and it's replayable. And you can reach more travel agents with a CTA product and you can hope to meet one-on-one. -on -one. So uh, there are certainly uh, many advantages for using WeChat to reach 
Chinese travel agent. Certainly something that uh, Dragon Trail can help you with uh, if you are interested in doing so. Uh, great. Our next question is, do I need an established relationship with Ctrip or another OTA to maximize the effectiveness of my social media marketing? Um, so Ctrip is China's number one OTA, um, and it's the, it's the world's second largest OTA, uh, so it's quite an important one to know. Um, and advertising on Ctrip, uh, Ctrip is a platform where people make bookings, um, but also it's a place where you can inspire travelers. So having advertising on C trip, let's say um, a user is there doing some research about a different destination, or perhaps they're booking a trip somewhere, but then they see an ad for another destination, um, and that can inspire them for their next trip. Um, but C trip is just one kind of paid media channel, um, and there are others too. So there is the Chinese search engine Baidu, for instance. Um, or a Chinese travel review website, uh, which also has OTA functions like Mafang Wu, where users um, are likely to go to read reviews and travel diaries and research about destinations. Um, and so we would say, yes, if you have the budget, um, it is definitely worth looking into doing some kind of media buy um, with one platform or more platforms to be um, a complement to your social media and your other marketing. Um, but if you don't have the budget, maybe to focus on the social media first. Um, but yes, and if you are interested uh, in finding out more about Media Buy, uh, please get in touch with Dragon Trail after the webinar and uh, we can give more advice on how to do that. And now we're going to go back to an acronym I think that we introduced earlier uh, in, the, in the webinar, and that's about KOL, specifically what is a KOL? And the short answer is it's a key opinion leader. There are many different kinds of KOLs, including celebrities, internet celebrities, travel bloggers, and micro-influencers. KOLs can have a huge effect on travel preferences, but first you need to know your audience and your goals. Um, for example, Royal Caribbean and South Australia uh, paired with Dr. Huang Xiaoming, who has 54 million followers. But bigger isn't always better. Uh, sometimes working with smaller KOLs can help you reach a more engaged audience. For example, a classic music blogger, a uh, classical music blogger, or an archaeology blogger, as well as save you money. Also, think about your target market and pick KOLs that will help you reach them. In Peru, for example, uh, they chose an astronomy photographer and a rapper. Uh, the choices reflected the image they wanted to convey. Uh, adventurous, uh, cultural, and people that were also at ease with the camera uh, for video production. I know that we've had other KOL campaigns in North America that have uh, had more than a million viewers, so uh, the KOL approach is certainly uh, one that is, uh, has proven effective. Um, and the key takeaway is that a KOL doesn't need to have millions of followers to be effective. If you're promoting a niche product, a smaller KOL with a dedicated following, and someone who's recognized as an authority in their area of expertise may be just as effective as, uh, as one with a, a large general audience. Again, uh, part of the, this is determining your strategy to fit the KOL profiles to your desired outcomes. Okay, um, so now before uh, we wrap up the presentation, uh, we'll talk about some additional resources that you can read uh, because a lot of this was quite basic introductory stuff, um, but there are lots more resources online, especially on the Dragon Trail website where you can learn more about um, specific market segments or parts of the world um, or other topics uh, in Chinese outbound travel and digital marketing. Um, so first of all, on our own website, um, on our blog, we have um, 
regular articles on travel trends, reports on industry verticals, translations of Chinese reports um, about outbound travel trends, um, interviews with industry leaders, infographics, case studies, um, and even more kinds of articles there. So it's a, it's a good resource uh, to check out and we're constantly uploading uh, new content to it as well. Um, you can also follow us on social media. We're on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Um, and on all of those platforms, uh, we not only share um, our own content, but also some of the biggest news stories that are coming out in terms of Chinese digital marketing and uh, Chinese outbound travel and um, thought leadership pieces that we think are worth reading and um, important new reports and things like that. Um, I mentioned before about how you can rewatch any of our webinars um, on our website underneath the videos and presentations section. In addition to our webinars and some other videos about company services, we also have a video series called China Outbound Travel Pulse. This is created together with Kotri, the uh, China Outbound Tourism Research Institute. And the videos are short videos that are all based around uh, certain themes in Chinese tourism, where we interview uh, Chinese travelers about their experiences and opinions, and then also complement this with kind of fun, engaging analysis about the topic. And our video on summer travel just came out today, so you can see that on our website or on YouTube. Um, Dragon Trail and China Outbound Travel Pulse both have their own YouTube channels, and then all of those videos are also available to watch directly from our website. Um, I mentioned earlier about our WeChat rankings. Um, if you're not aware of this, this is a resource that Dragon Trail provides that is very unique. We started doing it at the beginning of 2017. Um, by tracking national tourism um, organizations, destination management organizations, airlines and cruise lines. And then in April of 2018, we added hotels and museums and attractions to the list. So there are six categories that we track each week. And because WeChat is quite a closed system and you can't see um, how many followers an account has. It can be hard to really have an industry benchmark um, of what accounts and what kinds of content that are doing well on WeChat. So what we started to do is to do weekly rankings where we look at how many views articles got. And we release a weekly ranking where we look at um, which accounts had the most views in each of those categories, as well as the top articles in each of those categories. And we also publish quarterly and annual reports based on those findings. Um, so now we can see which accounts are doing best on WeChat, but also which kinds of topics and strategies are the most popular ones on WeChat. And this can really help when you're thinking about your own strategy on WeChat as well. Um, finally, I would also encourage you to sign up for Dragon Trails newsletter. Uh, that's just a very easy way of getting all of our content for the month, all of the reports and articles, the um, WeChat reports, um, and a list of the top news stories um, from around the internet um, about Chinese outbound tourism and digital marketing, um, as well as finding out about all of our upcoming events, uh, including webinars and offline events. Um, straight to your inbox every month. Um, and then I'll just share here, uh, don't worry about writing them down because we will be sharing the presentation with everyone, um, but just a few third party websites that we think are really valuable resources for finding out more information, um, again, about Chinese tourism and digital marketing. And uh, before we move on to any Q&A, um, I'd like to first introduce next month's webinar. Um, that will be on Wednesday, the 19th of September. We'll be doing it together with our partner, TravPro. Um, they are an international B2B2C mobile software company. Um, and their CEO and co-founder, Jonathan Cooper, will be joined by Dragon Trails. Uh, CEO and co-founder uh, George Tsao to talk about global B2B marketing solutions. Um, so looking um, at uh, global solutions as well as solutions specifically for the Chinese uh, travel market. Um, that um, webinar is already on our website. There's a link there uh, so you can already register for that and we'll have more information on that coming soon as well. Um, so at this